Well, it took us over three hours to finally accomplish our goal, but we decided going into that day, it was happening. We didn't care how long it was gonna take. We didn't care what it was gonna take. It was gonna happen. We were like, this is the goal. You ever have a goal like that? Doesn't matter, you are going for it. This was that day. We were in Ohio. It was, uh, in, it was uh, summer of 2000. I know some of you weren't born, just work with me, okay? It was a hot summer day, and we were there at Cedar Point Amusement Park. Anybody know Cedar Point? Yeah. It was the opening of Millennium Force. Any Millennium Force riders? One. All right, you're going to get where I'm going. Okay, so if you don't know Millennium Force, I'm a coaster guy. Millennium Force in 2000, when it opened up, was the tallest and fastest roller coaster in the world. It was awesome. It went up 310 feet. And then on the initial drop, it was an 80 degree drop. It was an, y'all know what 90 degrees is, right? Like, I mean, it was an 80 degree drop. It reached speeds of 93 miles an hour. Thank you for front row for picking up. I appreciate that. I like the, I like the feedback. All right. It was, uh, and, and we decided going in, we were riding this thing. We don't care how long, we don't care what it takes. We are riding this thing. We were in line for over three hours. That actually broke down when we were in line. And we're like, we ain't moving. You know, and we're, we're going to ride this thing. And I want you guys to be there with me. Okay. Can, can you ride with me? All right, all right, so whatever you have to do to kind of envision this happening, it's going to be you and me, all the cars were two-seaters, then they had about nine cars, all right, so I want you to be there with me, so if you got to close your eyes to make it happen, not if you're, if you're, hey, if you're watching online or you're driving, don't close your eyes, all right, but everybody else, you can close your eyes, because there we are, we're, we're walking up, and it was so cool, because I actually got to ride in the front car. Man, you guys are playing along good, I like it, all right, so... So here we are. We get through the gate. We start walking up. I'm a gentleman, so I'm going to let you go in first. You go in. You sit down. I'm going to get in, sit down. And this is a fast and a high roller coaster, so I'm expecting, like, something over the shoulders. Oh, no, 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 no. It's this little lap bar that comes down. I'm like, I'm missing something. <laughs> right? You, and you and I look at each other like, what's going on? I don't know. Do you know? I, I don't know, but we're doing it, right? And, and there we are. The lap bar comes down. They come by, and they check the little thing, and we're just like, that's all we get. That's the only check. We're going 93 miles an hour. And then, you know, and check the lap bar, and it's, it's solid, I guess. And, and we go, we look at each other. We're like, can you believe we're doing this? No, but we're doing it, right? And we're in there, and we're sitting down, and we are ready. And, of course, they get on the speaker. Welcome to Cedar Point. Please keep your arms and legs inside the car at all times. Please enjoy the tallest and fastest roller coaster in the world, Millennium Force. <laughs> this goes south. I know I can get a job. All right, so... And so the ride starts. And come on, if you've ridden roller coasters, I was expecting like the <laughs> going up. You almost couldn't hear anything. I mean, there was like this pulley system. It was almost complete silent as you're going up 310 feet. The way where they built Millennium Force, it was so awesome. When you got up to the top, you could look off to the left and you could actually see Lake Erie. It was awesome. It was so beautiful. And we're getting up to the top. And then the not so beautiful sight, as in the first car, we start dipping over. And of course, we got to wait for the rest of the cars to catch up to us, right? And we're just kind of dangling. And then, boom, 93 miles an hour, almost instantly, our faces are like, <laughs> it's over four Gs as we're on this thing. We are zooming. And then we're going to go up this little embank curve like this. It's not completely inverted. Then we go under a tunnel. We go up another hill down another one, and we are, the whole time, you're at 93 miles an hour, and we're just like, this is crazy. The beautiful thing about the site being on the lake was awesome. The downside is, it's by a lake, and there's a lot of bugs, and I swallowed one. <laughs> you're there with me. Maybe you did too. Maybe more than one. I don't know. And then, unfortunately, there was another one that just crossed my path, exploded on my forehead, and we go under a, uh, another tunnel, up another embankment, after a over 6,000-foot roller coaster, over two minutes and 20 seconds, we finally come to a halt, and we're just like, oh, my hair was spiked up to this day. Same thing, right? And it's just like, oh, I can't believe we did I can't believe it. we did that. It's just like, ah, oh, we rode Millennium Force. The lap bar comes up. We get off, and our legs are all like, Ooh, right? And hearts are going like this, and we're just like, oh, I can't believe we just did that. Wasn't it a fun ride? Didn't you have a fun ride? Yeah. Now, here's the thing. You guys weren't really with me, beside me when I was on that ride riding it. 
But as we just closed our eyes and as we imagined it happening, it's like you were there. You could kind of see some of the sights, couldn't you? You could kind of feel what it was like to ride a roller coaster, maybe having some idea if you got a crazy person who drives fast of what it's like to go 93 miles an hour, and you, but you were there with me. Although you weren't literally there, you were there with me and you could smell it, you could feel it, you could taste it, you know, the bug, and, but you could, you were there. And I just wonder, why don't we ever read our Bibles that way? Why is it whenever we get to scripture, we look at it and we read it like it's the newspaper or a blog? And we never imagine ourselves in the story. And I'm not saying imagine as in imagine something that's not there. I'm not saying that at all, but imagining us being in the story because this is the story of life. God's word to you, God's word to me. And it, it encompasses all of our lives, whether we're followers or not. So my prayer for you, my prayer for me today is as we go through Paul's second missionary journey in Acts 16 and 17, my prayer is that, man, we would be able to connect with his word. That we would be able to, as we go through and we read, that we would be like, yeah, that's me. And we would connect in a way that it wouldn't just be entertaining, but it would be life-changing. And we have Acts chapter 16. So welcome to Christ United. It is awesome to see you guys today. And for those of you watching online, thank you so much for tuning in. Going to ask you guys to participate a little bit today. I hope that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. We'll see. All right. Um, every week we ask you guys, please, please, please bring your Bibles. We want you to have a Bible. It's okay if your Bible glows. Mine's glowing today because last time when I was up here, um, I realized I'm now 40 and I can't read the, the font. So now I now have an iPad with like 30 fonts so I can see it real good today. So if your Bible glows, it's perfectly okay. If you have a paper Bible, perfectly cool. Open it up to Acts chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles for you over here at the prayer booths. You can grab them. Um, it's a gift. We want you to have God's word. If, you, if you're trying to flip it and find it, you don't know where Acts is, go to the New Testament. Look for the books you can find. You know, the books you've heard about, the big books, names you can pronounce, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts is the very next book of the Bible. If you get to Romans or anything that's Ian's, you know, that ends in I-A-N-S, you went too far, back up to the left, Acts chapter 16. This is Paul's second missionary journey. If you're here a couple weeks ago, we talked about Paul's first missionary journey. And as I previewed this a couple weeks ago, I was going through it and someone was just like, why are we doing that again? I mean, because really his second journey is a lot like the first. You know, he goes, he preaches the gospel. People like it, people don't, people ask questions. They kick him, there's riots. They kick him out of places. It's all, it's pretty much the same. But today I want to be like, man, how do we make it different? How do we make it personal? How do we connect with God's word? What is God saying to us? through this. So we're going we're gonna to encounter three different people that Paul encounters in chapter 16, and then we're going to look at a city that he engages in chapter 17. So here we go. We're going to start in Acts 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Lytyra, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So we have Lydia. Lydia's kind of got life together. She's super successful. It says she was from Thyatira. She's also in Philippi. And she was a dealer in purple cloth, which was a very expensive clothing back in the first century. So, you know, just think of, um, you know, top great cities for fashion. If you were to think of New York, London, or Hong Kong, she basically had houses in both of these joints. So she was rich. I mean, she was really well off. It says she was even a worshiper of God. So she had denied all the other gods that were all around the Roman and Greek culture. She was following God. She was a worshiper of God. But yet when Paul came in and spoke to her, there was something missing. She would have been like, you know, I'm, I would say I'm a Christian, but obviously not all the way in because when Paul preaches the gospel to her, she responds to it and her family gets baptized. And I just, I mean, here she is, just thinking she's got it all together, going to church, you know, doing a first century version of like a Beth Moore, Priscilla Shire Bible study. And, and in the midst of that, she was still missing something. And the message of Christ spoke to her. And for some of us, that's our story, right? 
That, that's where God found us. Was that, you know what? I, I would have called myself a Christian. I went to church, yeah, kinda, you know, definitely Christmas and Easter. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I would say it, but you know, it, when I came down to it, there was really something missing and that is where God found me. And if that's your story, I just wanna ask you, raise your hand. It's not my story, I'm just trying to encourage you. Is that your story? Is that anybody? Yeah, a few of you. Don't be ashamed of that. Nothing to be ashamed of. And that's where God found you. And we see the power of the gospel at the work in Lydia's life. And I love where, where he goes next with the next person we encounter. Verse 16. Once we were going to the place of prayer where we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, I love this, Paul became so annoyed with her that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. And now we have slave girl. And I love how there is so much of a difference between Lydia and the slave girl. And I love how they're back to back. You have Lydia completely put together, successful, got everything going for her. And now we have the slave girl. Now, if I were to ask you, how many of you is that your story? You know, that you were, you were, a, you know, you were a slave, you were a demon, you know, possessed fortune teller. How many of you? My guess is I might get two of you. That's why I love Christ United. There might be a couple of you that are like, dang it. That was me, right? But, but let, let's tease this out a little bit. When we look at the slave girl, either by on her own steps or by the force of others, is now living a life of depravity where she is enslaved in bondage. And for some of us, that's our story where God spoke to us, isn't it? Where we were caught up in drugs, or alcohol, or pornography, and we were just so caught up. And in that darkness, you know, Lydia's a great story, but sorry, that wasn't where God found me. My place was a little bit different, a little darker. It was a little like Lydia's, or it was a little like the slave girl. And, I, and where God found me and where God connected with me was in a very, very dark place. In addiction, trading my body cheaply for no good reason, and the message of Christ reached in and spoke to her. And maybe that's your story. And if that is your story, put your hand up. If that's where God found you. Amen. Don't be ashamed of that. And it's amazing how God's word, it just, as Paul is preaching to people, as he's preaching to cities, it is for everyone. Because, I mean, when you look at it originally, when you see uh, the slave girl, she's walking around, it almost seems like she's a cheerleader for the gospel, right? Because it says that, what does it say there? It says she's following Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. It seems like she's walking around almost like flavor flave, you know? She's walking around with, with him and going, yeah, boy! And I realize I probably just gained half of you and lost half of you at the same time. That's, all right, but... But, but it seems like she's like a cheerleader for the gospel. But you have to realize she is demon-possessed fortune teller. She's actually being a distraction of the gospel. She is, she is not trying to advance the gospel. She's trying to distract from the gospel. And in that darkness where she is, the message of Christ reaches her. Cast a demon out, cast that spirit out. And now the owners are mad because now they can't make money off of our poor little slave girl. And for some of us, that's our story. That's where Jesus found us. And these guys get so mad that they decide to have Paul and Silas beaten and flogged. And it's where we meet our next person that Paul encounters. Verse 23, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer, listen to this, was commanded to do what? Guard them carefully. They've already been beaten and flogged. Hey, jailer, all you need to do is guard them carefully. Look what he does, verse 24. When he receives these orders, he put them in the inner cell, fastened their feet, and fastened their feet in stocks. Now, um, 
uh, what I was reading about with some of this uh, Roman history is that the inner cells was typically a little lower in the prisons. And it's where some, like the waste would kind of filter down. It was like the worst, nastiest part of the cell in the prison that you could possibly be in. And oftentimes, oftentimes, um, Roman soldiers who, you know, had a great deal of service with the, with the Roman empire as a retirement gift were um, given an opportunity to be a jailer at one of these prisons. As I, hey, here you go. Thanks for your hard work. You can now be a jailer. So here we have a jailer. And we don't know what he's seen. We don't know what he's done. But now, I mean, he wasn't ordered to put him in the inner cell. He wasn't ordered because when you put someone in stocks, that's those things that kind of forces your body into positions it's not naturally supposed to be in. So he is torturing them. And for some of us, that's where God found us, isn't it? Because we have to realize that the Roman Empire, the Roman regime was very brutal. They weren't known for giving out roses and stickers to people. They, they were, there, there's, there's accounts where they would rule a city, they would sack a city, and then they would crucify people from the city up on the city walls. That way anyone coming into the city would know, Rome was here, you better not rebel or this will happen to you. I mean, Rome was really ruthless. So we have no idea what this guy saw. We have no idea what he participated in. But he is now at a point in life, whenever all he's asked to do is guard them carefully, he tortures Paul and Silas. And he's got a whole bunch of aggression, a whole bunch of anger built up, and he's not gonna own it, but he puts it out on others. And for some of us, that's our story, isn't it? For some of us, that's where Jesus found us, was in a position of, man, you know what? Stuff was done to me. I have done things, and because of that, I'm not gonna own it, but man, I'm angry about it. And I'll take it out on other people because it was someone else's fault, not mine. And it's in that atmosphere, in that environment, that Jesus reached you. So let me ask you, if that's your story, will you put that? All right, now I'm testifying. That's my story. That's me. Angry people, put your hands up. See, y'all are angry just come asking you to do it, right? <laughs> and it's in that atmosphere that the gospel comes in and reaches an angry, aggression-filled jailer. And the whole story is awesome because if you, ever, if you ever want an earthquake to happen, just lock up one of the disciples. I mean, if you've been reading through Acts, every single time, you know, they lock up one of the, one of the apostles, you know, in, in a cell, there's an earthquake that happens. God's just like, you know, he doesn't need Jason Bourne or Ocean's Eleven, break them out. He just launches an earthquake and guys are, you know, free to go. And that's what happens. They're locked up an earthquake happens and skip down to verse 27. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, God bless you, and then immediately... He and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And isn't that part of some of our story? Man, that's where God found me. Having a whole bunch of anger and rage. I, don't know if, I know for some of us, we might be a little bit of a mixture. You know what, I'm a little jailer, a little bit of the slave girl. There's a little bit of Lydia for me. I'm just... I'm doing the motions, but honestly, there's definitely something I'm missing. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is that it is for everyone. Every one of these people needed Jesus. And regardless of where your story is and how it fits in with these three people, the truth is we're all sheep that have been led astray and have gone astray and need the good shepherd to come in and find us and rescue us. And, and once he does, the beautiful thing is, is that we're to be ambassadors back into those areas. The problem for a lot of us is, is we, that's where we struggle. It's like, man, Jesus, I'm so thankful for you saving my life. And we just leave it at that. And, and we're not on mission to do anything else. We're just happy. Hey, I'm in heaven. Cool, sweet, nothing else to do. But man, there is so, I mean, 
the cool thing about Paul's life is if you remember Paul, he was, if you, if you don't like Christian, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you don't like us, someone just promised you lunch and you're here, you would have loved Paul because he hated Christians. He persecuted Christians. He was, um, he was signing off on the murdering of Christians. I mean, he hated Christians. Had to come to Jesus meeting. Literally, Jesus was at the meeting and his life has changed forever. His life has changed forever. And once he's changed, he just realizes the message of the gospel has got to go to the ends of the earth. You know, there are, there are so many people out there who don't know Jesus. I now have to go and take that to the ends of the earth. And he just realized, thank you for saving me. My life is not over. Now it's just starting. So, so that's what he does. And you see him every time he's, he's somewhere, he is just preaching the gospel and he doesn't really care what happens to him. And that's whenever we flip over to chapter 17. Chapter 16, he encountered three people that I believe is all of us in some capacity that we can connect with. And then Paul goes out and he's now in Athens. And man, should this be a part of any of our lives? Verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Here's Paul. He went to Thessalonica first, preached the gospel. They got mad, started a riot, ran him out. He went to Berea, spread the gospel. A lot of stuff, you know, they chased him, kicked him out of there. Some people, be, some people saved. Now he's in Athens, walking around, and he sees that there are just hundreds, if not thousands, of different altars for different idols. I mean, they were all about some idols. In fact, as I was, uh, as I was <laughs> reading, I saw this one thing that, or someone said, it was easier to find a God in Athens than it was a human. I mean, th there was like a rainbow God. There was like a sun God, a moon God, a big toe God. I mean, there, there was just, there, was, th there were gods for everything. There were altars all through Athens and Paul is walking through Athens and was greatly distressed to see a city full of all these idols, knowing, man, do you know, Maybe they don't know what life is available to them. Here they are just idol worshiping like crazy. And he's like, man, that distresses me. So I want to ask you, for those of you who would say I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, what distresses you for the advancement of the gospel? To share what Jesus has done in your life and through your life, I mean, what distresses you to the point where you want to engage a person, a community, a city. I mean, what, what distresses you? I tell you, for me, one of the ones for me is it's families, you know, marriages, single people, and, and just how, you know, they, they live in, in, a, in a dating realm. And, and it's not because I've lived perfect in this area. It's because I've been jacked up in this area. And, and a lot of times, where we are freed from, man, we can see it so easily. And we just, usually we should be an ambassador back to that area. And I have just such a heart for this because I realized, man, for a long time, I was, I was not living to God's design as a husband, as a follower of Christ. Man, I, I, you know, and our marriage has been on the rocks multiple times. And, and it's just like, man, and, and God finally got a hold of me to the point where I was understanding his word enough of what his design for a husband should be. And I still don't live it perfect. Ask my wife, she'll testify, all right? But what I realize, what God's designed for a husband to be is that, you know what? Whatever I do, whatever my job is, I'm to work for the glory of God, not for the glory of man, no matter what it is I'm doing. That, that's what I'm supposed to be doing as far as my job. I'm supposed to come home. I'm supposed to check on Shan. How can I serve you? And then I'm to invest in the life of my kids. Get on the floor, play with them, Make sure they go to bed tucked in, praying with them, leading spiritually in my home, and then checking on my mama's heart, making sure she's once again okay. How's she doing in her heart? Because I'm telling you, men, we are called to be the spiritual leaders. Whether you are married or not, you, you are called to be a spiritual, and that's a lot of weight, and that can be difficult. Come on. So many times I will drive home into my driveway after a crazy stressful day, and I'm just like, I've earned some couch time right? I mean, the Steelers at max have about 18 games a year. Leave me alone, woman. Right? It's hard. And there are times I just want to come home and I just want, I just want some me time. 
But that's not God's design. His design is, man, you work hard for the glory of God, not for the glory of man, and you go home and you serve your wife and you pour spiritually into your children and you make sure your wife's heart's okay. And that's God's design for a husband. And I'm telling you, guys, when we're not living that way, we're really just boys that can shave. I'm just saying. And we have such a responsibility to lead spiritually. And women are held such an unequal standard. When you read through the scripture, you see, even if you go back in Thessalonica and Berea, how many prominent women are coming to know faith in Christ. And there is, I'm telling you, Christianity has done amazing things for the equality of women, but there are still distinct roles for men and women. And for men is to lead spiritually in your home. And I'll talk to guys, they'll be like, man, it's hard. Of course it's hard. God made it that way because he loves you. That way we wouldn't think we would go around thinking we could do it on our own. There are times I got to pull up into the driveway, sit in my car and be like, I could kill somebody. Right? God, give me a verse. Not that one. <laughs> no, nothing Old Testament. Give me something happy. Right? Right? It's hard. And you got to pull in the driveway and you have to lean on Christ. Of course it's hard. Because we're not meant to do it on our own. And through his power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to walk in and we're able to serve our wives. We're able to pour in spiritually to the lives of our children. I'm telling you, you want trying to be a spiritual leader and raising up two daughters, that's hard. I'm still trying to figure out the one I'm married to. Now I got two little ones. <laughs> I'm, I, I walk in and they're crying. I don't know what's going to boo. I, um, you know, I'm like, flare. Pff, I need some estrogen. <laughs> Something. I, I, don't, I don't know what's wrong. I, whatever. Why are you crying? Shake it all. I, I, you know, it's hard. But men, I'm telling you, God's design, that's what distresses me a lot for the gospel is to sit with men, to sit with families, to sit with couples. And not because I'm perfect, but because I have messed up in this area and to realize, man, God, see, if we take culture's view, culture's standards, because that's what we're gonna see here in Athens, they were all about the culture. They were all about what's new, what's the most progressive thing, because we can progress past God's design. And that's what we see in Athens. If you jump down here to verse 20, God bless you. This is, uh, this is like the, uh, the Supreme Council basically in Athens, the Aragopagus. They're saying to Paul, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking and listening about the latest ideas. They're just like, yeah, let's just pro progress past the next thing. You know what? We, we just, we just want to know what's new. What's the newest thing that, hey, this is going to be the new thing we can ride for a while. That's all they were caring about. And they were just like, man, what's new? Because they're thinking, man, there's another God. Hey, he's talking to us. Hey, maybe we're missing a God. And we actually see that here in verse 12 as Paul engages this city. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aragopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Isn't that awesome? He doesn't say, y'all are a bunch of morons. He doesn't say that. He didn't walk around being like, you guys are nuts. You got all these idols around. Are you crazy? He doesn't do that. He's like, no, no, no. I see you guys are very religious. He talks to them so calmly in a way that would engage them not distract them. He was like, hey, I can see you guys are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, remember, that's all these different idols in the city. He says, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant, and this isn't, you're an ignorant goober, it's not that. Said, so you're ignorant as in you are not aware of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So Paul's there in front of this, you know, council, you know, they're in Athens. And he was like, look, look, I can see you guys are really religious. As I walked around, I saw all of these altars. 
I saw all these altars to all these gods. I even saw this one altar where the inscription said to an unknown God, because what they were afraid of is that, hey, what if we forgot one of the gods and he shows up and wants to kill us all because we weren't worshiping? We can just say, no, 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 this was you. We just didn't know what to call you. What, Billy? Okay, we'll write Billy right there. All right, so they had this altar to an unknown God and Paul sees that as, ooh, there's my inn. He's like, I can see you were really religious. And I even see that you had an altar to an unknown God. I just want you to know I know him. And I'd like to tell you about this unknown God. What a powerful way of engaging somebody, engaging a city, engaging individuals, and he engages them. And then he does something that can be difficult, can be hard sometimes, but what he does is he deconstructs their cultural norm. But he does it in such a respectful way. Because he's like, hey, I can see you guys are religious. You even have an altar to an unknown God. I know him. Let me tell you about him. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Guys, you have all these temples that you built, the the unknown God, God of heaven and earth. He doesn't need any of that. He can't live in something built by human hands. And then he says, verse 25, and he's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. He, he, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's not based on what you do or whatever. He's like, no, 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 he doesn't need any of that. Rather, he himself gives everyone life. He gave you guys life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations. He's talking scripture here, but he's not saying the names. He's not saying Abraham. He's not throwing in Jesus here because they would have no clue who those people are. He was like, hey, from one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their land. Guys, you are here for a reason. God appointed you here for this specific time. And I love verse 27. You should circle, highlight, underline this verse. I love this. God did this. God set you apart for this time so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. There might be somebody in here who needs to hear that. Because when you... Think about your story. You're like a Lydia. You're just playing the role, not being real serious. You might be a, like the slave. You might be like an angry jailer. But you are here today for a purpose. And though, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what has been done to you, he is not far away from you. And that's what he tells these people. And then verse 28, he says, for in him, we live and move and have our being. And I love this. As some of your own poets, once again, he's using their culture to connect with them. Some of your own poets have even said, we are his offspring. Verse 29, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. Now, he's not saying we shouldn't, you know, that we should, you know, not use our human skill and our human design and our, our imaginations. He's not used saying that at all. He's, what he's saying here is, how in the world can you use what God has gifted you with to create something and then you worship that? He's like, no, that, that's not how it works. You, you've been given gifts by an amazing God. And to think that you could create something with the gifts he gave you, you can't worship that. He's like, that, that, that's not how it works. And, and so he, he takes a few sentences and he kind of deconstructs their culture. And then what's so important is that he reconstructs them. So often we are all about, man, we can deconstruct what you're doing wrong and we forget about how to build them back up. We forget the reconstruction. And, and any area where it's all about, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and, and you're never there to help build somebody up, it is hopelessness. And Paul doesn't leave them there. He deconstructs their culture, and then he reconstructs them back up. Verse 30, he says, in the past, God overlooked such, such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And that's just, uh, repent is kind of a a churchy word. It just means go the other direction. You are living a life, not God honoring. Repent, turn and go the other direction and start living a life honorable to God. For he has set a day 
when he will judge the world with justice by the man. He's talking about Jesus, but he doesn't say that because he doesn't, they don't know that. By the man, he is appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And there's the reconstruction of the people of Athens. He's like, look, I can see you're religious. You're the unknown God. He's the God of heaven and earth. You know, you, you can't, you know, he can't, you can't build something for him to live in. In fact, in fact, you're just to repent, turn from your evil ways and have faith in Jesus as is the reconstruction for all of us. Repent, faith in Christ. And he, and he reconstructs them and builds them back up. And when I think of the people in here who have been freed from the Lydia stage, who've been freed from the slave stage, who have been freed from the angry jailer stage, I think so often we are so hesitant to share our faith, to go out and try and start a C group, to try and make disciples, to try and share the gospel in any way is because of verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. They mocked him. Others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. And at that, Paul left the council and then 34, some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And I think so many of us, man, when we think about what happens when we engage people for the gospel, three things can happen. People can sneer. They can mock you. They might ask you more questions. In fact, some of you, that's why you're here today. You got some questions, you're just back. And others will believe. And I think oftentimes we miss out on two and three because we're afraid of number one. We're afraid of being mocked. We're afraid of being sneered because of what we're going to say of what Jesus has done to our lives to change us and the things he's done in our lives. And we see Paul, he was just like, you know what? Cool. I will move on. But his job was like, we've got to take the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Because if we don't engage people, if we don't engage cities, if we aren't distressed for some moving of the gospel in our lives, some Lydia's just stay trapped. Slaves stay slaves forever. And the jailer stays angry. When we don't get distressed for the advancement of the gospel. So I want to ask you, regardless of where your story is, if you're a Lydia whether you've been freed from that or whether you're still there. If, you're, if you were freed from the slavery of whatever that was, or if you're still there. If you were freed from the anger, the aggression that you have, or maybe you're still there. What's God calling you to? You know, if you've been freed from that, does it distress you at all to get back in there? Because if it doesn't, man, there's gonna be a lot of people who go and don't hear. Because the beautiful thing is God says, we're the messengers. There's no plan B. So I want to encourage you, what distresses you? And for those of you who are still in one of those areas, you're a Lydia, you're playing the part. You're a slave, you are trapped, and you honestly didn't think there was any way out. Or you just live life angry. Man, you got a lot of aggression. And you think, man, it ain't my fault but man, you take it out on somebody. I want you to know that your heavenly father loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to this earth to live a perfect life, to die for what you've done and everything that has been done to you so that you can live free. And he didn't do it just to free you. He did it also to give you a purpose in this life, to go and engage others with what you have been freed from. So we're gonna enter into a time where we just get to respond back to our heavenly father. And for those of you who have been freed from, from one of those, you've been freed from the Lydia state, the slave state, the jailer state. This time is for you just to, just to ask God, what should I be distressed over? You know, if it comes down to it, that what it is I should be distressed over, I realize I'm really just a boy that can shave. Will you contact us? Let us serve you. It's why we're crazy about C groups. It's why we're crazy about getting people connected in discipleship. Because we want to serve you in that way 
to get you to a place where you can see God's design for you, not the worldview for you. So will you let us know? And during this time, we just ask God, God, what are you distressing in me to do for the advancement of the gospel? And if I feel like, man, I'm just not prepared, will you give me the strength to go out and go to the C group counter and just ask, hey, how can I get involved? I wanna fulfill my purpose. And for those of you who are in here and you've never accepted Christ, will you just take this time and just ask, is there something I'm missing in my life? Because the answer is yes. And as we see with Lydia, as we saw with the slave girl, as we saw with the jailer, he opened their hearts and changed their lives. They needed Christ just as all of us do. And when you take this time that we get a chance to respond back to Heavenly Father just to say, maybe this is a step I need to take. Thank you for offering me a way out of the slavery, of the bondage, of the anger, of the complacency that my life is in. This time is for you to respond back to your heavenly Father.